What will be the effects of climate change? Will the increase of heat-trapping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere overwhelm our ecosystems? As we release carbon dioxide into the air through everyday activities, changes in the environment will occur. Most scientists who work on the climate change subject are concerned that these changes could accelerate and could also have some effects on you know, the way people live and the way ecosystems function. In order to mitigate effects on ecosystems, we need to know if anything can be done to offset the impacts of rising temperatures. One hypothesis is that as carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, oceans and forests will take up more and more of the gas. Forests cover a large part of the world, and there are two systems that hold carbon. Forests is one of them, oceans are the other. So if we can study and understand how forests absorb the carbon, how much they take in, how much they're releasing, we can get a better understanding of what's gonna happen around the world with respect to carbon. Forests are vital to our planet, in part because they can absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. As forests absorb carbon dioxide, they're taking that carbon and converting it into tree stuff. The mass of the tree, 95% of it, was formerly atmospheric carbon dioxide that was taken up in the process of photosynthesis, laid down in various sugars, accumulated into wood, leaves, bark, roots, all sorts of tissues. By absorbing carbon dioxide, forests could mitigate the effects of climate change on the ecosystems that we rely on. We're measuring the second stem. To find out if trees are growing faster as more CO2 is put into the atmosphere. 8.1. Jess Parker and a large team of researchers and volunteers have been tracking the growth of forest plots young and old. This is, a, this is not a sweet gum. Notice the bark is quite different from, oh, yeah. from the these leaves. Are different and the too. leaves are different. The, the sweet gum leaves look a little bit like a, you know, maple. like a maple, <laughs> but this has leaves like that. The team has so far measured about 50,000 trees on 55 different plots of land. A lot of the field work has been done by volunteers from the local community, or members of the HSBC Corporation, who take a week away from work to learn about forests and climate change. 125, please. I have as many as 12 volunteers who help me out in measuring trees, and a variety of other things as well. And uh, some of them have been with me for many years. And really, this work couldn't get done without them. Job, it's not particularly guys. difficult to make a measurement of a diameter of a tree, Great. but to get a good estimate of biomass in an area, you need to measure a lot of trees. Diameter is 6.8. 6.6. This one is uh, 7.1 centimeters in diameter. Uh, our measurement here is 75 centimeters diameter. For each tree, we measure the diameter, we assess the x and y coordinates, we assess the species, we give a tag number, we put the tag on, we figure out whether it's alive or dead or dying, and then we figure out the crown condition. The light is hitting from the top. Oh, is this a press or intermediate? I think it looks like it's intermediate. Yeah. Because it's got about two, three trees blocking it, so okay, but it's not getting enough light. It's getting sunlight from the top. Right. Okay. The diameter, as well as noting species and age, allow for calculations for determining the biomass of each tree. About 95% of the biomass of any tree is carbon. Biomass is the total above ground weight of a tree. So what we usually do is connect an easy to measure observation, such as the diameter of the tree, to this difficult one, biomass. And it turns out there's a large number of published equations, especially in North America, that connect the diameter of a tree to its biomass. And so that's what we use. And based on that diameter, we can determine how much biomass or stuff is in that tree. Well, I'm fundamentally interested in, in how forests grow over the long term. So we had a, a, a large number of plots, uh, areas of forests that were of the same kind, the different ages, and in which we measured the diameter of every tree in the plot. And then using various published equations, we figured out how much biomass there was in the plot. Normally, you're just looking at these plots once to get a, a snapshot of how the whole ensemble is behaving. But in our case, we went back and remeasured them as many as eight times. 
And uh, because of that remeasurement, we were able to, to see something about the recent behavior of those plots relative to the long-term behavior. Okay, go back 10 centimeters. In addition to using field data to track the total biomass of each tree over time, cores of trees are also used to estimate the age and the rate of growth. And what we can see here is that this is where the bark was, right? And down here uh, is the center of the tree. The cores reveal tree rings, and the spaces between the rings reveal how fast a given tree grew during a given year. You can actually estimate how large the tree was at any time in the past by subtracting these ring widths from its current diameter. So you can construct a history of the biomass of the tree all the way back to infancy. All of the data, from tree cores to measuring the diameters of trees over time, presented a real surprise. And the general trend is for forests to start growing rapidly but then slow down with age. So the contrast would be between a young forest with little biomass but really rapid growth and an old forest with lots of biomass but not very much growth. So this is the trend that we would expect. But what we found when we looked at the individual stands that we measured repeatedly was that instead of having this growth rate for a young forest, it was doing this. And instead of this growth rate for an intermediate forest, it was doing that. And instead of this growth rate for an old forest, it was doing that. In some 80% of the cases that we looked at, they were growing a lot faster than expected. Is this much faster rate of growth of trees a natural solution for climate change? Well, if the trees are growing faster, that means they're taking more CO2 out of the air. So to the extent that this is um, an effect that was stimulated by CO2 in the atmosphere, it probably means, or it could mean, that the CO2 concentrations are rising less rapidly than they would. Tree growth is right now keeping up with rising CO2 levels. But perhaps, eventually, the amounts of water and nutrients, what trees also need to grow, will be limited, and tree growth will not continue at the current accelerated rate. There's probably a stimulatory effect on the part of the extra atmospheric CO2, but we don't think it can go on for very long. First of all, eventually uh, trees run into other limitations, such as the availability of water or nutrients in the soil. There may be a certain point where no matter how much carbon dioxide you have in the atmosphere, um, the forest will no longer be able to grow because they just don't have the other resources that they need. To get a better idea on how long this accelerated growth will continue, Jess and his team are implementing new techniques for measuring tree growth. One technique is using a dendrometer. The dendrometer is wrapped around the trunk of a tree. As the tree expands, so will the dendrometer, and the amount the diameter has changed can be measured down to one hundredth of a millimeter. And that's a, a distance far thinner than your own hair. First I insert the jaws of the caliper into the gap, and here I got 42.98 millimeters. If we make measurements frequently throughout the growing season, we can figure out when the tree began to grow, we can figure out when it stopped growing, and we can even see small-term responses to things like droughts. They're really best for getting fine, time-based measurements of the responses of the trees. This data will give a clearer answer to whether forests will continue to grow at an accelerated rate, providing a barrier between us and a rapidly changing world, or slow down in their growth rates bringing the effects of climate change sooner than later. I think that as our population continues to grow and we continue to consume, I think it's still really important to be kind to our environment and be cautious with you know, how much fossil fuels we burn, whether we burn wood, how much we're cutting down forests, not just for fuel, but for agriculture and other purposes. We don't know if there's a limit to how much forests can grow. I mean, there, there may be a point where they are no longer the carbon sink, which is what we're trying to find out.